Let us pray. Living God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you are the God of all people. You are our rock. You are our redeemer. In Christ's name, amen. So I'm going to read from the Hebrew scripture, from the very first book of the Bible, the story of the Tower of Babel, found in Genesis 11, verses 1 to 9. Listen for God's word. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. As the people migrated from the east, they came upon a plain in the land of Shinar, and they settled there. And the people said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And there they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. And then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which mortals had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people. They all have one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. So come, let us go down and confuse their language there so that they will not understand one another's speech. So God scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. And therefore it is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I said earlier, the minor second interval is the smallest interval that's possible. It's simply two notes that are a half step apart. If you play them in a scale, they sound quite okay next to one another. But if you play them at the same time, they can sound harsh to our ears, grating as if they're a mistake. I mean, shouldn't all musical intervals only make beautiful sounds? Why do we even have dissonant minor second intervals? If all sounds were the ones that I like, the music I'm comfortable with, well, wouldn't things just be better all around? That strikes me as a very flawed and very human question. So I paired this discussion of a minor second interval with the story of the Tower of Babel. We usually read that story actually on Pentecost Sunday. But here's how the story of the Tower of Babel is usually summarized. Long ago, people gathered together in a city. They spoke one language and they were unified by one basic thought. Let us make for ourselves a tower up to the heavens. And as the story is retold, God saw this tower, grew angry at their pride, and so God scatters them over the face of the earth. And God also gave them lots of different languages to speak, a reality that extends even today. Now that's a very neat and tidy interpretation of this ancient story, but I'm afraid it's more than likely wrong. The minor second interval can help us understand the correct interpretation. But to help us, I have to do one more excursion and tell about another moment in history. I want to share about the famous Chinese treasure vessels of the 15th century. Long ago, in the early 1400s, China possessed a huge fleet of ships that were designed and used to literally explore the known world in Asia. By some estimates, they had 3,500 ships. Now, by point of comparison, the United States Navy currently has 430. Under the famed Admiral Zheng He, between the years 1405 and 1433, this massive flotilla explored all the way through the Arabian coastline, India, and even to the east coast of Africa with huge ships 
half the size of an aircraft carrier with crews that literally numbered in the thousands. And these ships then brought back to the Ming Dynasty rulers in China incredible riches. But in time, the Chinese leadership changed. And suddenly those in power in China became afraid of the growing merchant class in their midst. This group of people that according to the Confucian social order were at the very bottom rung. And so that fear led the Chinese rulers in the mid 1400s to literally turn inward. They stopped all sea exploration and they either burnt or let rot every single ship that they had. Now as fate would have it, 60 years later, a group of literally puny Portuguese ships would make their way along the western side of Africa around the Cape of Good Hope and discover the very lands the Chinese used to dominate. And within a few years, three other puny ships led by Columbus would make their way westward to the Americas. In that span of a few generations, the dominance of the entire seas shifted from the Chinese to European hands. And the history of civilization went in an entirely new direction. There are similarities between the fears of the 15th century Chinese leaders and the fears described in this Bible story of the Tower of Babel. See, in that city of Babel, the nomadic Palestinian people were finally starting to settle down. They now had bricks, they had mortar, they could make permanent homes for themselves. They could finally plant fields and domesticate animals, and they could find themselves living in the safety of towns. In fact, living even in great cities. They wanted this way of life to last. They wanted to make a name for themselves and be remembered. And yes, it's true, being humans just like us, a thirst for power and a pretty high dose of human vanity was part of their logic. But like the Chinese, who had the world's oceans literally at their disposal, but ended up burning their ships and retreating back behind their borders, the people of Babel became afraid. And what's said in scripture is they were afraid of being scattered over the face of the earth. And so they put up walls, they built a tower, they turned their back on the rest of God's world. I think in many ways that is actually the real point of the Tower of Babel story. Human beings want to stick close together. We find comfort in being in our own tribe, with our own people, with our own language, with our own rules and religion and social structures. But God is the God of all the earth, of all people, of all languages, of all cultures and nation states, and God calls us, wants us, to live as a global human family. From the very beginning of the Bible, just a few chapters before this, in the first creation story, God literally said, let us make humankind in our own image. And God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. When the Noah story completes and the ark once more is on dry land and the doors are opened and the people and the animals move out, they are told once more by God, go forth into the world, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Over and over again, that is God's command. But look at what happened in Babel. The people instead stopped in one place. They wanted to make their own rules. They wanted to make a name for themselves instead of living by the name they'd been given. Children of God, citizens of a global world. That Babel instinct is both ancient and modern. A self-centered anxiety caused the Chinese to destroy their treasure fleets. It led Britain to boast that the sun never set on the British Empire. It led Hitler to proclaim a thousand-year reign of the Reich. It led Americans to believe it was somehow ethical to own other humans and still ethical to build walls to keep others out. 
Throughout human history, our response is to build towers of power, of wealth, of vanity, to make a name for ourselves and seeing others as a threat, of seeing those who are so similar to us as a dissonance that must be silenced. In the Tower of Babel story, God came down to earth and scattered the people. There is no description of God, though, being angry. And we often think that God scattering the people was some type of punishment. But God only acts for a purpose. God only acts not out of anger, but out of love, out of desiring to set things right. From the dawn of creation, it was God's intent for people to know their creator and then to go out and to multiply over the earth. Remember the parable in the New Testament where God is described as a sower who sows seed generously over a wide range of soil, wantonly, wildly, scattering them everywhere. Now maybe the one language that was spoken in Babel was a language that was only self-focused, that only knew how to value power wealth, and glory. Maybe by being scattered over the lands and given different languages by God, the people would stop and humbly discover the wisdom that comes from having to hear a common truth in a different tongue, from learning how to communicate in someone else's language, and through that, discover the joy of finding that commonality that crosses human borders. And maybe in that movement outward, they would discover the unity that is stronger than the diversity that is part of God's ever-present plan and eternal love. Like a minor second note, only a half step apart, maybe they would stop for one's confusing difference with dissonance. The church lectionary always assigns the Tower of Babel story to be read on Pentecost Sunday. And I think that combination does it a disservice. Yes, it's true. The Babel story ends with people literally babbling about in different languages, while the Pentecost story seems to reverse that situation when the disciples poured out into the streets of Jerusalem and now began to communicate in the languages of all the foreigners that were gathered in that city, telling them about Jesus' resurrection. But maybe the Tower of Babel story should always be read today on World Communion Sunday. Because what is today about? Today is a time to imagine people literally the world over gathering for prayer and worship singing and sharing a communion meal, a sacrament where Christ is both the host and the substance. The settings for these global gatherings are as different as you can imagine, from huts and houses to small chapels to cathedrals. The bread and the juice, as Pastor Heather has mentioned, will not look the same at all of these tables, nor will it taste the same. The songs that will be sung will not all use the same harmonies. The prayers that are spoken will be offered literally in hundreds of different languages. The words to our ears may sound strange, but that fault lies with us, not with the prayer. This scattered, sacred, unified witness of World Communion Sunday is part of God's plan. Be fruitful and multiply and go ye out into all the world, says the Lord of heaven and earth. The dissonance of two notes in close proximity to one another does not change the fact that both are of the same scale and both are needed to make beautiful melodies. And the same is true of us, who live literally in close proximity to so many Yet too often we find ourselves afraid of being scattered, of our influence waning, of our privilege not being respected. As if in being scattered there is any place in the world we could go where God is not already there. So instead of answers, 
I leave you with these questions. Why have I believed that my words, my culture, my faith is the one that must be protected? What is God's purpose in creating a world of so many people and such rich, diverse cultures? And how might I live to honor what the Lord intends for me and for all of God's children? Thanks be to God. Amen.